The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples went into Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Back on the first Sunday of Advent, we began year B of the Revised Common Lectionary. That means that our principal gospel, the gospel from which we read the most during this particular year, will be the gospel of Mark. And I have to tell you that Mark is my favorite of all the gospels. I love its sense of urgency, the spare language, its direct language, and the way it sort of moves along with a constant refrain, immediately, immediately this happened, immediately this next thing happened, immediately there's this energy and there's this push that moves you through the gospel with your heart racing, anticipating what it is that might come next. And I would urge all of us, since we seem to have so much Time these days um, to spend a couple of hours one afternoon reading the Gospel of Mark from the beginning to the end. Now, I think that's an important thing for all of us to do, to spend time with our scriptures, and I really do hope that you'll take me up on this invitation and read the Gospel of Mark in that way. But I do need to warn you up front that those first few chapters of Mark's Gospel may confound and surprise you just a little bit. Mark doesn't start out with an infancy narrative. He doesn't talk about a star or wise men or the angel Gabriel's visit to Mary. Mark doesn't talk about Mary's trip to see her cousin who is also with child. Mark starts his gospel at Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan. Jesus shows up. John the Baptist is out there wearing camel's hair and eating locusts and wild honey. And Jesus is baptized and goes into the wilderness and then comes back gathers a few disciples, begins to tell people that the kingdom of God has come near and to preach that good news. That in itself is maybe surprise enough that Mark doesn't spend any time with an infancy narrative, and that may confound some of us. But then Jesus' first 
public act, his first act of ministry that Mark details in his gospel is the one that we heard this morning. Jesus is in Capernaum, a village on the Sea of Galilee, one that in other passages will be referred to as Jesus' home. And he is in the synagogue teaching. And among them is a man with an unclean spirit who speaks to Jesus in the first person plural and in the first person singular. What have you to do with us? We know who you are. Have you come to destroy us? An evil spirit, a demon. Those are things that we wrestle with, things that we don't understand, don't believe, don't acknowledge easily. And so these first few chapters of Mark's gospel may be confounding on multiple levels. But I think that I might be about to confound you once again because there is reference to these evil spirits in our Book of Common Prayer. Whenever there's a baptism here at St. Andrew's, we renew our baptismal vows, and we hear them pretty frequently, and we repeat them ourselves. But there's a part of that baptismal liturgy that only the candidates for holy baptism or their sponsors say. And so it might be easy for us to let them slide and not pay too much attention. But right there in the Book of Common Prayer on page 302, we ask the candidates for holy baptism or their parents and sponsors on their behalf do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? Do you renounce the evil powers of this world which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? In the part of the baptismal vows that we all recite every time there's a baptism, our response to the questions is, I will with God's help. But here in this portion of the liturgy, the question is, do you? And the response is, I renounce them. Clearly, there's something more to this idea of unclean spirits, of evil spirits, of demons, than we are apt to acknowledge. So what is it that we're talking about in that baptismal covenant, in our baptismal vows, in that liturgy? What might be the unclean or evil spirits that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God. If we get over our discomfort in this moment and think for just a moment, I'm guessing that all of us can name some of those spirits. A spirit of me first. A spirit of scarcity that causes us to cling to what we have, that gives us a sense that there is a zero-sum game, and if someone else gets some, there might not be enough for me, no matter what it is that we're talking about. A spirit of addiction that binds people to their worst inclinations and behaviors and won't let them go, a spirit of anger, a spirit of distrust, a spirit that gets so caught up in bizarre conspiracy theories that those who hold them find themselves pushed to the fringes of our society and then responding in anger when people don't understand or believe them. 
there are plenty of unclean spirits that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God, and they are at work in our midst, turning the world from the beloved community which God envisions for all of us into something else, something that presiding Bishop Michael Curry often refers to as a nightmare. There are unclean spirits at work, even now. This past week, the Executive Council of the General Convention of the Episcopal Church released a statement that was given at the beginning of their most recent gathering that highlighted one of these unclean spirits, or maybe a couple of them, that I think should be front and center in our hearts and in our minds and in our efforts to renounce all of the things that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God. These are the words of the President of the House of Deputies, the Reverend Dr. Gay Jennings, and she gave these remarks to the Executive Council on January 22nd. She says, you have probably seen as I have the coverage detailing how white Christian nationalism fueled the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Signs, banners, and flags carried by the rioters declared allegiance to Jesus and the former president, sometimes conflating them and pledged fealty to God, guns, and America. One group styled itself after Joshua, fighting the Battle of Jericho, marching to make the walls of corruption crumble. Others described visions from God endorsing their efforts to overturn the results of the presidential election or claimed that their efforts to save America from tyranny are inspired by God. The stories, signs, and symbols of our faith are being put to violent use by people who want to establish a nation in which power and privilege is held exclusively by white Christians. This isn't simply a set of policy disagreements between liberals and conservatives, between people who want elected officials to enact laws based on one set of values instead of another. It is domestic terrorism. She goes on a little later in her remarks to say, if we will not tell the world that that is not Christianity, then who will? In our reading today from Mark's Gospel, a man with an unclean spirit shows up in the synagogue, within the walls of their sacred gathering place, within the walls of their faith community. And Jesus through his authoritative word and teaching, banishes that unclean spirit. What President Jennings describes in her remarks to the Executive Council is the arrival of an unclean spirit within the walls of our faith community, within the walls of our tradition. And when she asks us, if we won't tell the world that this is not Christianity, then who will? She is pointing out to us that we are called in this moment to renounce the evil forces that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God. Now, it might be easy to think that there's nothing that we can do. As individuals, what power do we have? How can we overturn? How can we oust this spirit of white supremacy and white nationalism? How can we make it clear to the world that this is not Christianity? 
And how can we make it clear to the people who have adopted these evil forces, these unclean spirits, that what they are doing and what they are thinking is not consonant with the faith that they proclaim? Jesus, in that synagogue in Capernaum, doesn't cast out the unclean spirit from the entire world. He casts it out from one person. And while the world might not have been changed as a result of that encounter, that one person was. President Jennings says in her comments that she is not asserting that all people who are on the other side of the political spectrum from her are engaged in this unclean spirit, these evil forces. But she is saying that it is our calling and our vocation to offer them an offering a way to step back, a way to step back, a way to renounce those evil forces. Reconciliation is at the heart of her message. And she is calling in her comments for legislation within the Episcopal Church to devote significant resources and energy to the development of language, to the development of programming, to the development of processes that will help all of us to engage in this work. The Gospel of Mark drives us forward Immediately, there is this sense of urgency. And Jesus starts his ministry. The first thing he does is to address the unclean spirit, the evil forces that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God by reaching out to one person and setting them free. If you do, take me up on my invitation and read the whole Gospel of Mark in a single set setting. And you allow that first public act to frame your interpretation of the rest of the Gospel, you'll discover that that is exactly what Jesus is about. Confronting and destroying the unclean spirits the evil forces that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God. Jesus' authoritative teaching and word is what makes that possible. Jesus' authoritative teaching and word is what pushes this unclean spirit out of this poor man and sets him free. And it is Jesus' authoritative teaching and word which can do the same thing for us, for me, and for you, and allow us to help others, to help set them free. So perhaps there's a little more urgency in my invitation to sit and read Mark's gospel from beginning to end. Maybe there's a little sense of immediacy for the need to sit down and immerse ourselves in Jesus' authoritative teaching and word. I'm recording this sermon on Saturday morning, but I'm assuming that when we all see this together on Sunday, there will be many more inches of snow on the ground than there are today, and that the roads will be a mess, we'll have some shoveling to do. But I'm going to suggest that after you've done the shoveling, and while it's still not safe to drive, you settle into your favorite reading chair with a cup of tea or decaf coffee. You light the fire if you have that available to you. You put a blanket over your lap. And you spend a couple of hours 
immersing yourself in the life-giving and liberating Word of God. Amen.